I'm Lynn Packer with the 11th installment of my YouTube video series on Operation Underground Railroad. In this edition, the OUR criminal investigation expands. Here are the headlines. Davis County Attorney Troy Rawlings says his criminal investigation is vibrant and productive, that his investigators are dealing with a cascade of evidence and witnesses. The FBI has been working the case. Officially, an FBI spokesperson told me she will neither confirm nor deny any investigation into Tim Ballard, OUR, or Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. The Salt Lake District Attorney's Office has met with Rawlings and his investigators and is thinking about weighing in. In this report, former OUR Rehab Director Ed Smart breaks his silence. OUR's Chief Financial Officer Tevia Ware quits and forms her own anti-sex trafficking charity, but still brags about the tens of millions she administered for OUR. Tim Ballard, while under criminal investigation, contemplates running against Mitt Romney in four years for the U.S. Senate. And Mormon head apostle M. Russell Ballard, who is suspected of secretly helping kickstart OUR financially, promotes his son's and son-in-law's business ventures out of his church administrative building office. All began with Ed Smart speaking out. Smart, of course, gained notoriety as the father of kidnap victim Elizabeth Smart. Looking back at Smart's role with OUR, he was OUR's aftercare director in 2014 and 2015. Elizabeth Smart joined the OUR board with great fanfare. OUR planned to merge with the Elizabeth Smart Foundation. It never fully materialized. Before OUR became an IRS-approved 501c3 charity, it solicited tax-deductible donations through the Smart Foundation. In 2014, Ed Smart was among OUR's highest profile figures. Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes, Tim Ballard, himself, and his daughter Elizabeth. OUR's website trumpeted the purported OUR Smart Foundation merger, showing that Elizabeth Smart was put on the OUR Board of Governors and that Ed Smart was named Director for Prevention and Rehabilitation. Ed Smart also spoke at OUR events, did news interviews, as reflected in this TV news story excerpt. His daughter was kidnapped, tortured, and sexually assaulted when she was only 14. Now, Ed Smart is on a mission to rescue children from sex trafficking. When we can help our children understand, here is a line in the sand, and this, res this represents what is and isn't acceptable. And when that line is crossed, regardless of who it is, here's what you can do. While the Smart OUR union was highly publicized, OUR did not announce the breakup, Elizabeth Smart leaving the board and Ed Smart quitting his job. Looking back, Ed Smart told me he is totally disillusioned with OUR and Tim Ballard. He said, when I heard Tim make comments that I felt were not true, I became even more disillusioned. I made proposals about aftercare that were not being taken seriously. He said, it hurts me to see people pour money into OUR when I feel it's very undeserving. One thing I would say about Tim and his organization, they were a money-making machine. Smart told me he was in the Dominican Republic during the bungled Guardi rescue mission. I reported on the failed rescue in my YouTube episode 10. You might also check out the Vice World News report online titled, OUR's blundering overseas missions. In summary, Tim Ballard was certain they would find Gesno Marty's kidnapped son, Gardy. Ballard was being guided by Utah psychic Janet Russon. Smart said he was in the Dominican Republic's capital, Santo Domingo, working on OUR aftercare matters, when all of a sudden Tim Ballard told him about a mission to rescue kidnap victim Gardy Marty. Psychic Russin said Gardy was being held in a slave labor camp near the DR Haitian border. Ballard and other operatives came to Santa Domingo from Haiti, and from there the quickly assembled rescue team would depart to a remote location near the border. 
Before departing Santo Domingo to rescue Gardi, five team members went to the LDS temple to pray about the mission. They also visited a site in the city where LDS Apostle M. Russell Ballard rededicated the country for Mormon missionary work. The dedication site is shown in this video clip from an LDS Church promotional video. Latter-day Saint missionaries began sharing the church's message in this Caribbean country just over 30 years ago. Beginning with only 26 members in one small congregation, church membership in the Dominican Republic has grown to more than 110,000. M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was in the Dominican Republic in 1978 when missionary work formally began. He returned to the Caribbean nation in November 2009 to visit with local members and leaders and to reflect on the church's progress there. This brings back a lot of fond memories. Ed Smart says Tim Ballard took the Guardi rescue team to the Santo Domingo location where Russell Ballard had dedicated the Dominican Republic for missionary work. At the site, according to Smart, Tim Ballard called Elder Ballard on the phone to discuss OUR's Guardi rescue mission. Ed Smart says the expense of the failed Guardi rescue mission was horrendous. That night after the mission was a failure, Ballard told Smart and other team members, don't say anything about it. Smart said participants were asked to sign non-disclosure agreements. There were threats made to those who might say something, he said. And Ballard did not want it coming out. They were using a psychic. Let's turn to a new development since my last report in March, Op-Ed 10. OUR's Chief Financial Officer, Tevia Ware, quit and formed her own child rescue nonprofit. Why is that significant? Tevia Ware was OUR's main money person. She played the most important financial role among OUR's nepotistic officers and directors. Of course, Tim Ballard was president and CEO. He's had various titles over the years. Tevia Ware, CFO, sister-in-law, Catherine Ballard's sister. Julianne Ballard Blake, a director and a sister. Todd Reynolds, director, brother-in-law, he married Shauna Ballard, Mark Reynolds, director, Todd's brother, and Emily Ballard Evans, the spokesperson, a sister. Evans, by the way, has repeatedly declined my requests for comments and interviews. OUR's financial oversight headquarters was Ware's rural Cedar City residence. Ware lives in a farmhouse off a dirt road in rural Cedar City, until she resigned earlier this year, it was OUR's financial nerve center, where, at least in theory, where would manage budgets, make financial plans, and oversee accounting. Her salary in 2019, when OUR last reported, was $127,000. Ware also made appearances for OUR, making many of the same unproven claims about child sex slavery that her brother-in-law makes. But she lacks Tim Ballard's messaging skill, as in this example where she's trying to explain the significance of OUR's never-ending search for the missing Gardy Marty. Uh, for example, there was one uh, boy that was born in the U.S. Um, you saw in that clip, it was Haiti. I don't know if you could recognize that area, but... Um, he was, his family was in Haiti at the time when he was kidnapped. And so while he was a U.S. citizen, it allowed the U.S., it allowed him as an agent to pursue the case for a certain amount of time. Um, it had its limitations, especially once they had gone through several, um, you know, he was sold out of one orphanage and into a different um, orphanage and then gone from there. Uh, just, you know, w w our tax dollars are limited. We have to um be selective in in how uh, we use those funds where's resignation is the most significant among many other rats fleeing our sinking ship it's because of the importance of cfos and because she's tim ballard's sister-in-law she founded a new our like child rescue nonprofit, coaction global two others who already abandoned ship joined her new charity Coaction's website touts Ware's previous work at OUR 
without ever saying Operation Underground Railroad. She brags about the money OUR took in. Her website says that during her career, referring to but not naming OUR, she has facilitated growth from $990,000 to more than $38,700,000 in annual revenue, with net assets exceeding $60 million. As OUR CFO, she was responsible for managing the finances that are now under scrutiny by criminal investigators. CFOs of companies under criminal investigation are often targets. As an example, Donald Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg is under threat of criminal indictment if he does not flip on Trump, rat Trump out, and provide testimony against him. However, in this case, Ware may have already flipped on her brother-in-law. Speculation persists she was one of the first insiders to turn on Ballard, providing testimony and records. The two main partners with their new venture, John Lines and Carlos Rodriguez, have already quit OUR and are known to be cooperating with the criminal probe. I asked Ware in emails we exchanged about her flipping on Ballard. In her reply, she offered no comment and declined an interview. Neither Ware nor Davis County Attorney Troy Rawlings will comment on whether Ware has been given immunity from prosecution in exchange for her testimony and records. Utah MLM doTERRA, which withdrew its financial support for OUR, now backs Ware's child rescue venture. It's likely doTERRA would have wanted some assurance before backing her charity that Ware does not face possible prosecution should any criminal charges ensue. Another person who should have wanted assurance Ware had no chance of being charged is the person she picked to chair her board of directors. Coaction's board chairman is the former executive director of the Utah Department of Commerce, Francine Gianni, where she was over consumer protection, responsible for rooting out charity fraud. Would she have joined Coaction if there was any chance where Lines or Rodriguez could be swept up in a criminal investigation? I don't know. She would not do an interview. In fact, all Coaction board members and officers declined interviews. I did ask about Gianni's role in my email exchange with Ware. I wrote, Francine Gianni's role as board chairperson is especially relevant, given her previous job protecting consumers from frauds and scams. Her Division of Consumer Protection oversees Utah nonprofit registrations. As one example, her division did revoke the license held by the Utah nonprofit National School Foundation that I reported on more than a decade ago. But that was only after its promoters were criminally charged in Minnesota not Utah, and after the charity collapsed into bankruptcy. It may be noteworthy who replaced Ware as OUR's chief financial officer. Simon Brewer replaced Ware as CFO in February. I reported earlier on Brewer's previous job as CFO for the Utah penny stock venture Predictive Technology Group. Predictive had run into trouble with the SEC regarding claims it made for its COVID-19 rapid test. CEO Brad Robinson had a previous run-in with the SEC over alleged false claims for a cholesterol-lowering algae water product. Former Utah Senator and high-profile OUR supporter Orrin Hatch is on Predictive's board, as shown on its website. Predictive CEO Brad Robinson is alleged to have falsely claimed that a Chinese manufacturing partner received Chinese government approval to distribute its antibody tests. He was previously sued over claims of non-compliant marketing of a medical cholesterol-lowering algae water product. He was accused of falsely stating that one of his products would be pitched by Dr. Oz and the Gates Foundation and he was previously charged by the SEC over allegations of issuing false press releases. Predictive Technology partners with the Utah, Florida company, Wellgistics LLC, for distribution. Wellgistics and its CEO, Brian Norton, 
as I previously reported, has ties to Operation Underground Railroad and Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. I reported in Op-Ed 10 that Norton's name appears on a whiteboard illustration that Tim Ballard drew. It shows Brian Norton's involvement financially with Ballard's Slave Stealers television series project. One source claims Norton is paying Ballard $9,000 a month for rights to participate in that venture. I also reported that Mormon Church Apostle Russell Ballard, according to the whiteboard, is also a Slave Stealers partner. Here, Russell Ballard is pictured with Glenn Beck and Tim Ballard, both covenant adherents. Tim Ballard at the whiteboard meeting implied that Russell Ballard also has a financial interest in the book's spinoff television series. I also reported in Op-Ed 10 that Russell Ballard's name appears on the whiteboard illustration. I had asked Mormon Church Media Relations about Ballard's investment along with another general authority. The other general authority, I wrote in an email, there may be more than one, who was said to have invested in an OUR-related entity is Robert Gay, whose business partner, Steve Young, is a well-known OUR supporter. I made a direct request to Elder Gay's office for confirmation and or comment, and he also declined to return my call. The Mormon Church spokesman declined comment. For more detail about Russell Ballard's business history, see my YouTube video, Part 6, posted in December. The next section of this video report is about Russell Ballard's alleged use of his church position to steer investments to his son and son-in-law's businesses in a fashion similar to their alleged involvement in financially backing Tim Ballard and Operation Underground Railroad. It's about the Mormon Church's Kirtland, Ohio project. I interviewed Utah Mega Project developer Mark Jensen about his help finding donors for the Mormon Church Project in Kirtland, Ohio, and how that fundraising is connected to Ballard Family Business Ventures. This section is about Mark Jensen's fundraising endeavor with Russell Ballard and meeting his son Craig and son-in-law Brad. But first, who is Mark Jensen? He was in the news five years ago. Mark Jensen was at the center of criminal charges against former Utah Attorneys General Mark Shurtleff and John Swallow in the 2014-2017 time frame. Charges against Shurtleff were dropped and Swallow was acquitted at trial. Jensen, in a somewhat related matter, was charged and held in jail until his trial in 2015. A jury found him innocent. Before all that, earlier in the decade, Jensen became involved in the Kirtland Project. It all began when Russell Ballard asked Mark Jensen to come to his office at 47 East South Temple, the church's main administration building, to discuss a calling of sorts. Jensen made a note of it. Ballard asked Jensen to bring well-to-do LDS donors who were able to make minimum $50,000 donations to Ballard's office to finalize the transactions. The money would be used to enhance LDS church properties near the Kirtland, Ohio Temple to rebuild key landmarks, build a new visitor center, and improving infrastructure, such as roads. The landmarks are near the Kirtland Temple, owned by the Community of Christ Church. Faithful Mormons believe Jesus Christ appeared there as well as Moses and the prophets Elijah and Elias. At its 1836 dedication, many in the congregation had visions, saw angels, and spoke in tongues. Russell Ballard would refer to it as a great Pentecostal outpouring. So, what happened when Jensen and prospective donors met in Ballard's office? Jensen claims that during the meetings, Elder Ballard would suggest that donors also consider investing with his son, Craig Ballard, and son-in-law, Brad Brower. Subsequent meetings were set up at their offices in Farmington next to a facility where powders and drinks, that is, nutritional supplements, are formulated for various multi-level marketing ventures. As an example, one of several Kirtland donors who Jensen says invested in the Ballard family enterprise, was Mormon billionaire Gene Yamagata, handled by Yamagata's CFO, David Sr. 
Jensen claims Ballard fired him from his calling after Jensen, at least one of the Kirtland donors, expressed concern about the propriety of linking church donations to investments with Ballard's family. But Jensen says after his termination, he was re-engaged, but under the direction of two other apostles, Henry Eyring and Jeffrey Holland. Jensen says the fundraising continued. I ask LDS Church Media Relations for interviews and a response. They declined. What does all this have to do with OUR? First, it shows that Russell Ballard's alleged secret investment in OUR through a business entity controlled by his son or son-in-law is plausible. But there's also a more direct connection. It's about Mark Jensen, the FBI, OUR, and Russell Ballard. While Jensen was in jail awaiting trial, he was interviewed many times by the FBI about Mark Shirtliff and John Swallow. This is a photo of one of the interviews I conducted with Jensen in 2013 when I wrote about the AG scandals. At one point, the agents asked if he knew Tim Ballard. Jensen told them he knew Russell Ballard and had met his sons who manufactured what he called potions and powder for multi-level marketing companies. The agents wanted to know more about them. Jensen asked why. We're looking into it, he was told. They also asked him about Ed Smart, who was with OUR at the time. FBI agents hinted they were looking into the alleged illegal use of OUR's nonprofit money in Ballard's for-profit movie-making ventures, which means the FBI's current investigation into OUR may not have been the first time it took an interest. In 2015 and again in 2017, I reported about the connection between Ballard's for-profit and nonprofit enterprises. I used this flowchart to show the relationships. This is what I wrote. Spokespeople say the two entities are separate, one a nonprofit charity, the other a for-profit film production company. By law, charities with tax-exempt status cannot make a profit and are not supposed to have strong ties to any for-profit venture. It seems, however, the two are joined at the hip. The final topic for this report, Tim Ballard considers running for political office, the U.S. Senate. One source says Ballard thought about running for the Senate seat vacated by Orrin Hatch in 2018. That did not happen, and Mitt Romney filled the slot. Another source says Ballard is now looking at unseating his fellow Republican, Mitt Romney, who never jumped on the OUR bandwagon like Senators Hatch and Mike Lee. And Romney is out of favor with Donald Trump and is reviled by the ultra-conservative wing of the Utah Republican Party. A Tim Ballard candidacy would have a lot of pluses. He already has statewide, even nationwide, name recognition. He excels at image making, branding himself and OUR as fearless pedophile fighters on behalf of child sex crime victims. He has Utah's mainstream news media in his back pocket. He's connected to hundreds, if not thousands, of OUR donors who potentially could be campaign donors. And he's very close to Donald Trump, who holds tremendous sway over Utah's Republican Party apparatus and over most U Utah GOP voters. What if Ballard is charged with a crime? Sure, that could derail any political ambition. But who knows? It could also be a plus. A big plus. Mormon Church founder Joseph Smith was prosecuted many times. Indeed, he was murdered while in jail awaiting trial. Yet Smith remained deeply revered by many, if not most, of his followers. If Ballard is prosecuted, his followers may write it off as a deep state conspiracy or even accuse prosecutors of being part of a shadowy satanic cabal out to protect pedophiles. Ballard's Trump connection could give him an enormous edge in Utah. Ballard co-chaired former President Trump's advisory council to end human trafficking. He also met with his daughter Ivanka, who was in charge of her father's anti-trafficking effort. 
He's shown here at a meeting with former Senator Orrin Hatch to discuss child sex trafficking issues. In May this year, Ballard appeared on Glenn Beck's television show to reveal how he used his White House connections to rescue about 10 of what he called adult sex slaves from a brothel in an undisclosed country. Ballard told Beck that what he called a clandestine, amazing rescue took place during the presidential campaign. He said mothers, he said they all had children, mothers living in one undisclosed country were offered jobs in another. But when they arrived there, they were drugged, kidnapped, and taken to yet a third country where they were locked in cells behind a brothel and forced into prostitution. But they all have one thing in common. They wake up in another country where they don't speak the language, uh, one of the most horrific, corrupt countries in the world. Bad. And wake up literally naked and raped immediately and told this is your new life. You will, you will work here and you will be a sex slave in, in, in essence. They had these women, Glenn, we, we, cause our, our guys were on the ground there and literally in a jail cell behind the brothel, literally bar, bars that lock from the outside. Um, luckily we had super tight connections with the white house at the time. Again, just like Tony, one phone call to the white house. We need visas. This never happens. That's not, they're not going to give us visas. There's no nexus direct to the United States. Right. There's no, Instantly, no, no problem. You're gonna, you'll have them as soon as we can print them out. Ballard said the police that OUR had partnered with to arrest the traffickers turned out to be corrupt. He said those police instead were bribed by the pimps or traffickers. Then the traffickers and police chased Ballard's operatives as they rescued the kidnapped prostitutes and dashed them to freedom. Ballard said life strategist Tony Robbins provided a private jet to fly them to Washington, D.C., where they met President Trump in secret at the White House. Ballard said an American university gave the rescued prostitutes scholarships, and they're all attending college. It appears from one of the video clips that one or more of them has already graduated. Ballard told Beck that the amazing rescue will be portrayed in an upcoming documentary movie. By the way, Ballard's anti-child sex crimes wingman, Sean Reyes, also has close Trump family ties. If Mike Lee could take down fellow Republican Bob Bennett, then why couldn't Tim Ballard take out Mitt Romney in four years? Trump dislikes Romney so much that he unsuccessfully tried to talk Orrin Hatch into seeking another term in 2018. Politico reported that Trump waged a behind-the-scenes campaign to keep Romney, the most prominent never-Trump Republican, out of the Senate. During the election, Trump called Romney a choke artist for losing the 2012 election, while Romney gave a speech calling Trump a phony and a fraud. Here's the inside skinny. The same month Ballard was telling Glenn Beck about the amazing rescue, he met with Tina Horlocker, former Davis County GOP chair, to discuss a possible primary run against Mitt Romney. It was one of perhaps several related meetings. Alaska Attorney General Treg Taylor was at one meeting in Lehigh, Utah. Taylor and his spokesperson declined comment. As I said, Tina Horlocker is the former chairperson of the Davis County Republican Party. She describes herself as a constitutionalist, mother of 10, and believer of Jesus Christ. Her daughter, Olivia Don, was recently elected secretary of Utah State GOP. At the same state convention, Horlocker was among leaders who unsuccessfully sought to censure Mitt Romney for his vote to convict Trump for inciting a January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Tina Horlocker and her daughter Olivia were at the January 6th Washington, D.C. rally protesting Joe Biden's election. Olivia was wearing an OUR sweatshirt. Both of them post support for Tim Ballard on social media. They also used a Facebook app to broadcast live from the January 6th protest. There are millions of people here. 
and we're at the Capitol, we're there inside, and they, someone's, some people stormed the no, Capitol. No, I think storming the is the wrong, okay. the Entered wrong Entered the Capitol. No, they did not. They're not inside the Capitol at all. They are on the steps outside. Okay, okay. I mean, when you think about it, really, this is a coup. Everyone knows there's election fraud. Everyone knows that Joe Biden, there's no way he could have been elected as president. They were able to identify that several of these people, in fact, were Antifa. So I, that does not discount. That does not make anything better. That is not trying to excuse the Trump supporters who were included in the people that stormed the Capitol. I am not doing that in any way. I want to be very, very clear. Violence for the sake of violence is never, ever, ever okay. I love our president. I love Donald J. Trump. I love what he has done. I on January 7th, the website Utah Standard News published a photo of Tina Horlocker with Utahns for Trump at the rally and included links to the Horlocker's videos. By the way, FBI agents months later interviewed Horlocker about her presence at the rally. According to a source knowledgeable about the meetings, here's what they talked about. A potential Tim Ballard candidacy to run against Mitt Romney. OUR's million dollars in donations to Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes's Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, ICAC, and whether Reyes deceived Ballard about how the money was used. Troy Rawlings' criminal investigation into OUR. An upcoming OUR operation to rescue child sex abuse victims and the investigation's purported interference with its execution. Or Lacker knows Rawlings as the former chairman of his Davis County Republican Party. Horlocker, on Ballard's behalf, made contact with Rawlings in an attempt to solve the claimed hindrance. OUR's apparent concern, the Davis County Attorney's investigation, or warnings about OUR's legitimacy, was interfering with an imminent OUR rescue of child sex slaves. OUR sometimes uses off-duty law enforcement officers as operatives. Apparently, due to some sort of caution that may have gone out from Troy Rawlings, some police chiefs did not want their officers participating. The problem needed to be quickly resolved. Children's lives were at risk. According to Horlocker, after she made contact with Rawlings, Ballard said the matter was resolved. In fact, he believed he was no longer a target of the investigation. This note about how the Ballard-Horlocker meetings took place. One meeting took place in Lehigh and another in the parking lot of OUR's Draper office. The source who learned about the meeting said Ballard did not want to talk on the phone in case his line was tapped. And when they met at his office in Draper, he wanted to talk in the parking lot in case his office was bugged. First, I'll talk about OUR's million-dollar donation to Attorney General Sean Reyes's ICAC task force. Again, according to a source familiar with the Ballard-Horlocker meetings, because Ballard heard his donations were part of an internal AG investigation and Davis County's outside criminal investigation, he asked Sean Reyes for an accounting of OUR's donations. Reyes complied. Ballard learned from Reyes's report that the million dollars was not spent as promised. Ballard felt like he had been used and deceived by Reyes. Ballard and Reyes had a falling out. If true, it means the end of perhaps the highest profile bromance in Utah history. It will take me a few minutes to explain the complexity of this part of the criminal investigation. First, why was ICAC even brought up in the Ballard-Horlocker meeting? Remember, there are two investigations going on, one inside the AG's office and the other one outside by Troy Rawlings. It's believed the Davis County criminal probe has two interests in ICAC. First, did OUR mislead donors and take credit for how ICAC was using donated money to combat child sex abuse by pedophiles? Second, did Sean Reyes's AG office mislead the federal government when his office applied for federal ICAC grants? I talked about ICAC in previous reports. Here's a reminder of what ICAC is. 
It's a federal program funded by Congress and administered by the U.S. Department of Justice, the DOJ, to investigate and prosecute pedophiles who use the Internet to exploit and even sexually assault children. In 2020, the DOJ provided $34.7 million to a network of 61 task forces. If you pay taxes, you help pay for it. Utah's task force, managed by Sean Reyes' Attorney General's Office, consists of multiple local law enforcement agencies. In Utah, the AG applies for ICAC federal funds on behalf of the member agencies. The DOJ has granted Utah more than $1.4 million for the AG's ICAC. All task forces, like Utah's, get federal funds based on their performance. For example, how many pedophiles they arrest. OUR frequently publicizes its support of A.G. Reyes's ICAC task force, taking partial credit, like this press release that shows the Utah A.G. ICAC logo and the OUR logo together. OUR posted running Utah ICAC stats and took credit for them. Here are some more typical claims. I won't read through them, just showing you some examples. OUR's 2018 Form 990 tax return shows, for example, in 2018 it donated almost a quarter of the million dollars total it has donated to Attorney General Reyes's task force. Questions. Did the task force really use the money to combat child sex crimes? If OUR's donation was not used for that purpose, was OUR misleading donors? Several months ago, I reported that Utah's ICAC has terminated its partnership with OUR, which meant that Reyes's AG office no longer accepted OUR money, training, or assistance nabbing pedophiles. I had asked the Attorney General's office to provide records associated with its severed ties with Operation Underground Railroad. That request was denied because of what it called a pending criminal investigation. Plus, there's another suspected ICAC fraud matter hanging like a dark cloud over Reyes's Attorney General office. As the Davis County Attorney's office continues its criminal investigation into the Utah AG's handling of ICAC money, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Utah continues civil litigation that alleges the AG's office misused ICAC money. These are separate legal proceedings, but they involve the very same issue. Has federal grant money that was supposed to be used to detect and prosecute pedophile pornographers not used for that purpose? The Salt Lake Tribune and many other news outlets reported that federal authorities are suing some of Utah's top public safety officials alleging they committed fraud by misusing millions of dollars in grants that were part of stimulus programs during the Great Recession. They allege that Utah officials defrauded the federal government out of more than $17 million using four grant programs. One of those programs was ICAC. About $1.3 million of the suspected ill-gotten gain was granted to ICAC. Among the defendants is Leo Lucy, Sean Reyes's current Chief of Criminal Investigations, his main ICAG man. Here's the ICAG chain of command in the AG's office, Sean Reyes, then Spencer Austin, and then Leo Lucy. Sean Reyes is defending Leo Lucy. Reyes said, although this alleged conduct took place before I or my team was in office, we know these defendants. He said, they are upstanding public servants of Utah. Mistakes may have been made in the grant process, but the notion that these individuals and their agencies were all involved in some massive predatory and prolonged conspiracy to defraud the federal government is not only far-fetched, but simply wrong. By way of this postscript, here's an update on Tim Ballard's movie, The Sound of Freedom, that is yet to be released in theaters. It's still being billed as coming soon, even though it's been coming soon for more than two years. The movie stars Jim Caviezel, who recently made headlines of his own while promoting the movie.
On April 16th, Caviezel appeared live and Ballard appeared on recorded video at the ultra-conservative Health and Freedom Conference in Oklahoma to promote their movie. During his interview, Caviezel promoted the false QAnon conspiracy theory regarding the adrenochroming of children. Tim is, is a, is a real-life hero. I mean, you're playing the part of a real-life uh, hero. He was supposed to be in the room with me in, uh, in right here or in Tulsa, but he's down there saving children as we speak. I'm so sorry I can't be with you at your Health and Freedom Conference. Uh, I'm actually here doing an operation overseas, which I hope to be able to tell you about soon. Uh, it's involving the, the rescue of kids as young as 12 years old. We've because they're pulling kids out of the darkest recesses of hell right now, in dumbs and all kinds of places. Uh, the adrenochroming of children, the... I mean you said a word a minute ago, and I, I want to clarify what that word was, because you said a word, and yeah. I want to make sure that... You said adrenochrome. Yeah. When you are scared, you produce adrenaline. Uh, if you're an athlete, you get in the fourth quarter, you have adrenaline that comes out of you. If a child knows he's going to die, uh, his body will uh, secrete this uh, adrenaline. This is one of the best films I've ever done in my life. Um, the film is on a level of, of Academy Award um, level. Uh, this movie is really important. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity for the world to understand what is happening. That there are millions of children who are forced into the commercial sex trade, millions of children being bought and sold, and the world doesn't know. How can they know if there's not some vehicle to teach them and convert them to the cause? This film, I believe, does that. It converts people to the cause, and until we get millions converted to the cause, millions of kids will be stuck in sex slavery, stuck in hell. By the way, during the conference, neither Caviezel nor Ballard disclosed when and where The Sound of Freedom will premiere in theaters. Thanks for watching.